And welcome everyone to this edition of Broadcaster Hour. I'm Roger Hoover coming to you from South Carolina. We've got Kyle Crooks coming to you from Florida. And in the center of the screen, we have the voice of the Tennessee Titans from Tennessee, Mike Keith, who joins us. And Mike, first of all, just welcome to the show. And, you know, we've had all these broadcasters, but you're the first to wear a headset for the show. How's everything going? Well, we've got a new setup here at home because Roger, um, and first of all, it's a pleasure to be on with you. We've got a, a, a bit of a new setup here because we're going to continue to do things at home. Uh, even though the NFL is in training camp, uh, we're going to continue to do more things, and we're anticipating that we're going to have to do more things in season at home. And so, yeah, a little bit of different setup, and uh, I, I'm kind of uh, enjoying sort of some of the new technology and learning all that I have to learn. And with everything going on now in professional sports and watching announcers call games off monitors, is that something that you're prepared for? It seems like baseball is kind of easy, I guess, basketball, but football is a whole different animal when you talk about having to call a game off a monitor, right? It, it really is, Kyle, because I, I think the difficulty with football is there's so many things that happen away from the ball. In baseball, the ball dictates everything totally dictates the rhythm of the game you've got the pitcher you've got the batter you've got the catcher you've got the umpire you know all of those sorts of things then when the ball is struck the camera follows where the ball goes and the player makes the play it's the same thing in basketball now granted the the second baseman is repositioning himself a guy setting a pick on the block there are other things that are happening in the sport but it's largely about the ball. Football, I mean, if a guy's running wide open and you don't see him on camera, that's something that we can see doing a radio broadcast. If there's a big problem on the sideline and they're desperately trying to get a timeout or something's happening, that's a part of what you're doing. If there's an injury, if a guy's struggling to get to the sideline and he goes down, you know, there are parts of the story that if you can't see it, um, or if a safety's limping, if he's trying to play with a limp, he's obviously twisted an ankle. You know, those are parts of the story that you can't see. So I'm hopeful, Kyle, that we won't have to do games off monitors. If we do, we'll do it. You know, we'll do it. We'll, we'll make it work. And, and I admire the professionalism that we're seeing right now from a, a lot of broadcasters who are having to do it in different ways. And I think you see why some of the guys who are particularly great – are particularly great. And I know Roger wants to ask about your time at Tennessee, but, uh, but I'll ask, you know, when you're a student, uh, what was your broadcast experience like as you're first trying to get into this and, and turn this into a career? Student radio, you know, and, and you hope that the university that you go to has a great student radio station. And the University of Tennessee actually is one of the best in the country, WUTK. New Rock 90, uh, back when I enrolled there in the 80s, they played alternative music that was, it was actually alternative of alternative. I mean, even people who were alternative thought this music was alternative. Um, and so when we would stop to do the news, which included a sports cast, the, the listeners, and there weren't many, but they would call and they were furious. They were so angry, Kyle. They were so mad that we would that we would actually stop and think about how, how could we do this? And, um, you know, so I started there. And the great thing about student radio is the reps that you get, because there aren't many people listening. And if I messed up or I said something stupid or if I couldn't pronounce a word or you know, I just made any sort of mistake. It wasn't the end of the world, you know, and, and they didn't replay it 74 times on YouTube or tweet it out or whatever. I mean, I just made a mistake and I had nearly two years of student radio and I was doing other things at the time on a, on a part time basis. But you, you just you learn to do those sorts of things and you made those mistakes and you got those reps and you got comfortable. So like I'm on with you right now, I'm nervous. 
every time I go on somewhere, I'm still nervous to this day, but I'm not terrified. And I think all of us who do this remember when people always say, you know, aren't you terrified? Yeah, when you start, you're you are terrified. Sure. Um, but as you get more comfortable, you learn to manage the nerves and it makes you better. And that's and that's where student radio is such a big deal. I tell anybody, I said, if you're interested in broadcasting, don't go somewhere that they don't have student radio. If they don't, then you then you're not going to have a broadcasting career. Mike, now we've gotten to the John Ward portion of the show uh, because he was certainly one of my big heroes growing up in Tennessee. I know the same is for you as well. And I'm curious, when you met him for the first time, did he quiz you on the county seats of Tennessee like he did me? <laughs> no, I got I got that later. He did that on the air. <laughs> oh, wow. He did that on the – he said to me one time um, – and I'm, I'm from East Tennessee, grew up in Middle Tennessee. When I got the Titans job, I had never been to West Tennessee. And for your audience who doesn't know like we do, Roger, Tennessee is really three states. Mm -hmm. Completely different terrain, different accents, different politics, different. I mean, everything is completely different. So on the air, he asked me about a particular county in West Tennessee that I think I had heard of. I don't know. And, uh, I mean, it was pretty humiliating. Because let's go back to the big orange scoreboard. And standing by is a man who is going to tell you the county seat of Obion County, Mikey. And I'm like, I have no... And so I had a pretty good response. So I was pretty pleased to be a young guy. I came back and said, you know, John, if... If I said that, if I if I laid that out, what that was, I, I would be acting like I was really smart. So I'm not going to do that because that will make me look like I'm trying to be a wise guy. And I don't want to come across like I know more than other people. I didn't have any idea <laughs> that it was Union City. I didn't have the first clue. And um, so that was, yeah, that was, I had a lot of fascinating experiences. I was with him for 12 years. And so it was um, it, it was it was kind of like the I like the three parts of Tennessee. I sort of had three stages with him. I had the phase where I was scared of him, the phase where he basically tortured me and then the phase where he accepted me as passable. And then after I left, we had a completely different relationship and. Uh, at the end of his life, had a very different relationship as well. And it was um, it was very rewarding in all ways. It, it really was because I I mean, he humbled me. He made sure that I knew I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. When I was 21, I thought I was really smart. I thought I was an expert at everything, especially broadcasting. I, when I was 21, I thought I invented broadcasting and um, I didn't. For, for, you know, that, I really didn't. Uh, and so uh, t he, he made sure I knew that. And that was that was a good lesson. So when I meet young broadcasters today who think they invented broadcasting, um, you're not allowed to sort of do and say what they did to me because you'd be, you know, they would say you were cruel. And but for me, it was a great lesson. I needed it, and I'm thankful for it. I don't do it to young broadcasters, but I certainly think it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob Kessling certainly did it when I was 21. Oh, I really thought, yeah, I had a broadcasting award, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> I learned after that. <laughs> yeah, well, Bob's from that school, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he and, and John did the same thing to Bob. And Bob is, I guess Bob's almost 15 years older than I am. So Bob's not going to change. I mean, uh, he he's going to, you're going to come into the fraternity in a very, and Bob did it to me too. I mean, he, he did the same thing to me in a lot of ways that it was very helpful because it's a humbling business. It's a, it's a very, at the moment you think you have it figured out. I mean, even today, uh, there are still, for me, very humbling moments in in realizing that there's always something to learn about how you do it. 
And then as well with John Ward, what can you tell us about his preparation process, what was important for him to have with him in the booth, whether it was the scripted ad-libs, what was important for him on the spot chart, and just what did you learn about preparation from John? He was. That's the biggest thing, that if you see what I do, you know I came from him. Because I have so much stuff ready to go for every single game. And um, we two years ago, we did the season opener in Miami, and we were on the air from kickoff to final whistle seven hours and eight minutes. That doesn't count pre or post. And we were prepared to do seven hours and eight minutes because of the two lightning delays because we had everything scripted out. I mean, John John worked a lot more off of a spot chart than what I did and what I do. Um, the difference in, in John and me, I think, in some ways, is John did not play football. John played a little bit of basketball. He was really a more insightful basketball announcer because he knew the game better. You could tell he knew the game better if you just talked to him. Football, I mean, he, he knew football, but he, he couldn't tell you what a certain coverage was or what the X's and O's were. And I, I don't really know all that either. I played. So I know certain things about how you block certain plays. I mean, there are things that I know from having played um, that kind of fit me a little bit better. And so a lot of my prep is not as much on the spot chart. It's how I work with my spotter. The guy who spots for me is a guy named Rhett Bryan. And Rhett totally spots the defense. I spot the offense. Because that's where, um, having done high, I did high school for 10 years before I ever, junior varsity football, I mean, whatever. And so I didn't have a spot. So I got used to spotting the offense. And when he came over, I said, you've just got the defense. That's all you, I said, you just worry about the defense. And so we sort of get into this rhythm based on, I do this, he does this, John, called the game off his spot chart. Bob Kessling, he had this elaborate spot chart and it was built like on wood and he had thumbtacks everywhere and it was raised letters. I mean, it looked like something made from a craft shop on HGTV. I mean, it's phenomenal. But Kessling, when he spotted for him, he would have to put his finger on the quarterback and his finger on the tailback before every play. Then when the if the tailback got the ball, he would keep his finger on the tailback and then he would have to reach over and point to the player who made the tackle. And and so he's doing the binoculars in one hand. He would set that down to put his finger on the thumbtack of the guy who made the tackle. He would have to change the thumbtacks of guys when they checked in and out of the game. So if they change tailbacks, if Smith came in the game and Jones went out of the game, he would have to change that thumbtack. It was almost as if outside of the direction the play went and the success of the play, John totally called the game off, to, off what Bob was spotting. I work off the most unimpressive spot chart you've ever seen. It looks like something out of kindergarten, okay? Because I'm not, I'm not as worried about that now hometowns and colleges and backgrounds and history and all that i keep those i've got a folder right over here i keep those in a folder and then i have everything tacked up on the wall and i keep everything tacked up on the wall in a certain order so when i need something i know exactly where i'm going to turn for it and that's how i do it i do all a lot of the same stuff john did but i execute it differently it's a really long answer to your question i apologize but it it's what ward taught me and when we got through the seven hour eight minute game he was the first person that i thought of he had just passed away three months earlier but every, everybody was like oh that was so great you guys did that and you know we did t-shirts for the staff you called the longest game in nfl history because we're proud of it as broadcasters you're proud of that but at the same time to me, that's what we're expected to do. You know, that's we show up and go. 
from a, a play-by-play technique standpoint, so setting up formation, describing certain things, how much of how John Ward actually called the actual play-by-play has, has stuck with you throughout the years? Virtually none. Because what I came to realize, Kyle, and what he talked to me about at length is you can't do it like I did it. You've got to do it like you do. And so there is almost none of that. Of course, the thing is, John ain't called a football game since 1998. There is no I formation anymore. There, There is no, you know, I mean, all John had to deal with was one tight end or, or a tight end on either side. He didn't have to deal with six wide receivers. And I mean, if somebody went to the shotgun, that was amazing. Oh my goodness. The Dallas Cowboys shotgun, because the Cowboys were the only team. They started the, the, the shotgun thing under Tom Landry. And it came from the single wing. Tom Landry took that out of the single wing. Well, of course, everybody now who lines up under center. It's the first thing we say about every quarterback who goes in the draft. Old Jones there's never been under center before since he was the quarterback in grass cutters. You know, I mean, it's a it's a whole thing. So it's it's vastly different now because the game has changed. And I really see myself, particularly with the color commentator that I have now, Dave McGinnis, who is the only current radio analyst in the NFL for a team who used to be a head coach. Coach Mack is a amazing so i'm a pa announcer i set it up they give the ball to henry he runs at right guard he picks up six yards wilson makes the tackle at second and four and then coach mack just goes well they're in 13 personnel and they did did, you know i don't even know what all that is (laughs) and i think part of the issue that we have in broadcasting today is a we got all these play-by-play guys who want to be their own color announcer and B they love that because their whole thing right now is they want to show you how smart they are how much ball they know listen I'll tell you a secret I know what 13 personnel is I know I go to practice I, I get it I I tell people I don't because I don't want to be my own analyst I've got the best analyst I think in the world One of the national networks tried to hire him away from us this past season. I mean, he's that good. And so if I've got this, you know, you think about this. If I got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on the block and the other team can't stop him, what am I going to do? Who am I going to pass the ball to? I'm going to pass the ball to Kareem. And Kareem's going to shoot that sky hook and we're going to win the game. And maybe I don't score but I got 20 assists and we win the game. We win the championship. That's what I got in Dave McGinnis. I got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on the block and they can't stop him. So I'm going to be Magic Johnson passing him the ball instead of Magic Johnson having to take the shot. And I think as broadcasters, you have to know what it is you have. Maybe you have an inexperienced color commentator. Okay, well, then you have to talk a little more. You have to set that guy up a little bit more. Um You have some people who never stop talking that you work with. I I see from the look on both of your faces, you know, these people, (laughs) then, then you have some people that you have to draw out, you know, and, and then the other thing that, you know, too, is there certain things that your partner really enjoys talking about, you know? And so you've got to hit these points. We'll come in. I'll come in with 10 things that I know Coach Mack has seen in practice that he really likes or something about I've I've got I've got a list of 10 things. I'm going to hit all 10 of those in the broadcast because I want to make sure he gets the ball on the block and can shoot the sky hook right there and make it. The most important thing is what you're giving the audience in terms of the picture. It's not showing how smart you are. Because let's face it, if we were really smart, we wouldn't be in radio, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we'd be solving the world's problems yeah that's right and i want to get to your your first year in the play-by-play chair at tennessee because what a year it was right mm-hmm. you have the the miracle play against buffalo and and i remember that super bowl like it was yesterday yard short dyson reaches the football out 
um, for you, first year in the, in that chair, that that's got to be a whirlwind for the amount of big games that you were thrust into that year, especially calling a Super Bowl. There's nothing bigger. Right. The whole thing was was wacky because I took the job in May of '98, and that was the last year we were the Tennessee Oilers. The play-by-play announcer was a guy named Joe McConnell, and Joe is one of the greatest radio announcers in team history in the NFL. He did the Broncos. He did the Bears. He did the Vikings. He did the Colts. He did the Oilers. And he's one of these guys with that big pro announcer sound that I'll never have. You know, I I just, I won't. And Joe lived in Indianapolis. They wanted Joe to move here and be the guy. Joe it was married to a lady who had a fabulous job with, I think the school system in Indianapolis. And so she didn't want to move here. And Joe didn't want to move here either because all he did was call games and play golf. That was it. Joe's life was fantastic. Joe was probably early sixties at the time. And of course, 20 something years ago, Early 60s meant you were going to retire. Now that's still considered young. People go into their 80s. Now, Joe wasn't going into his 80s. So the feeling was among everybody, and it had it had been thrown out there that I would be the next guy when Joe did the one year. I did color for Joe in 98. They moved me here because I had sales background. I had marketing background. I, I had done a lot of shows. But play-by-play was actually like 10th on the list. They had never heard me do play-by-play when they hired me. But they needed somebody in the community who could get out and do different things, and that was me. So they made me the play-by-play announcer. And this is February of 99. And nobody thinks this is any big deal because the, the University of Tennessee is rolling at that point. Kessling's going to end up getting the Vols job. Uh, We've just drawn like 20,000 in Memphis in 97 and 25,000 at Vanderbilt in 98. Roger, you probably remember all this, but Kyle. I was at the last Oilers game when they played the Vikings. I remember that game at Vanderbilt Stadium. When they didn't didn't scrape all the ice off the bleachers and people, (laughs) it was a disaster. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> and and people were viewing this. And, and what was so cool for me is so I take over this job. And I'm, I'm a lot more prepared than what people know, because I've called like five million baseball games and high school football games. And I, I've called the 1995 National Paint Indoor Paintball Championship. I mean, I've called all kinds of stuff. And so I set out that year. I'm, so I'm just keeping it simple. That's all I'm doing. I'm not going to try to be, you know, at that time, Chris Berman or anybody who I'm, I'm just going to do what I do. I'm 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 just going to keep it simple. I got a great color analyst in Pat Ryan. Oh, he's so good. And so I'm going to let Pat just be the guy. That's it. So Pat's the star because Pat says all this stuff and he says crazy stuff. That chicken on the bone left here on third down and <laughs> chicks dig the long ball when we threw a long pass. And people liked hearing all this. Well, of course, we're winning. We start three and oh, we start six and one, we start nine and two, we finish thirteen and three. If my performance that year were a color, it would have been light beige. I, I mean, you couldn't have told anything. I mean, nobody repeated anything I said. It's exactly the way I wanted it. I wanted to be in, invisible. I wanted to learn how to do this job. I wanted to improve. I wanted to focus on these little things. So we play Buffalo in the playoff game. And I've had, I've had an okay year. I've done all right. I, I would give myself a C plus. Okay. That's all I wanted. I'm awful in this Buffalo game. I'm so bad. I I mean, I, if you'd have heard me doing a junior high school football game, you'd have thought this announcer is terrible. He's horrendous. Not only would you have not thought I'm an NFL announcer, you would have thought this is a disaster. You guys know this. You have one game every year where you got peanut butter on the roof of your mouth. It just happens. That happened to be my game. 
Seven minutes to go in the game. I'm a, I, I am literally about to cry. I'm so upset with myself. I walk to the back of the booth in a timeout. I take a deep breath. And I say, okay, what did John Ward teach you in moments like this? Time and score, down and distance, who made the tackle. Let's just keep it simple. Let's do what we've been trained to do. And let's get through this thing. And if they fire you tomorrow, they fire you tomorrow. You know, that's what that's what happens. But do what you've been taught to do. And so um, I went back up and was calling the final seven minutes. And with 16 seconds to go, Christie makes the field goal. Steve Christie makes the field goal. And we get set up for the kickoff. And it ends up being the Music City Miracle Play. And they end up using our call because none, none of the other three calls that had been made could be aired due to somebody talking over one another or, you know, bad air quality or whatever, which is crazy. And it becomes one of the most famous plays in NFL history. And I have to do a press conference the next day to talk. I, only time in my career I've ever had to do press availability. And the backstory is 30 minutes earlier, I'm thinking I'm getting fired. And then this happens, but the call went okay because John taught me, and I didn't know what the call sounded like until 30 minutes after the game. I didn't even think about it. But was it accurate? Yes, it was accurate. Was it good? We can debate that. Uh, people decide that. Fans decide that. You don't decide that. But what you do is you say, it was accurate, I can live with it. And if it's accurate, that's how it goes down. And so there, for the next 22 days, we go on this magical journey. We go beat Indianapolis, we go beat Jacksonville for the third time. We play what, at that point, was easily the most dramatic Super Bowl of all time. The team sells thousands of season tickets, becomes established here. And I get to ride in the parade in a car um, the first week in February, and, and it's like, how did this happen? And now I've been here 23 years. Um, it, it, it's like you you hope that you can prepare for something so at the moment where it all goes down, you just do what you're taught. And that's where you're really thankful for the John Wards and the Bob Kesslings and people who really trained you to do it the right way and, and about what's really important. Another one of those guys is John Wilkerson. And the first time I ever heard you call play-by-play, -play, you and John were doing Tennessee baseball games when I would come from Kingsport to Knoxville or Maryville for any reasons uh, growing up in the 90s. And I, I just loved how much enthusiasm you guys had for UT baseball. And I look back on it as well. I did one spring with him in 2012 as his color analyst and got to travel all over the SEC with him. And it was the most fun I ever had in broadcasting. I imagine for you, the friendship you guys had calling all those UT baseball games, doing sports talk really really was a lot of fun he was my roommate while we were well while i was in college he had graduated and he was my roommate and uh, we started doing ut baseball together and it was just this you know this magical run because they had never been good in baseball ever i mean they'd had like two good years in the history and so then we end up being there for what turns out to be the todd helton period which was a lot of fun but the, but the fun part of it was all the traveling. It's like, we didn't get on any planes. We did a game in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, finished the broadcast and got dinner, got the equipment in the car, got in the car, drove 650 miles back to Knoxville in time for him to go in and do the news at one radio station and me to go in and do the sports at WIVK. And it was like... I love that, you know, and, and I'm still nuts like that. I'm still crazy about doing the broadcast like that. I mean, people are like, well, NFL preseason. I'm like, dude, I grew up in a little town in Tennessee. I never thought I'd be in an NFL game. I love the preseason. I like the regular season. When we've been 2-14 and 14 or 3-13, and 13, obviously 3-13 and is better. For all of us, we're better broadcasters when we win. But the 
if you love it, you love it. And those we, we followed that team. You know, John and I'd go out and shag fly balls during batting practice. And R.A. Dickey went out to dinner with us on the road and never forget taking him out to dinner in Tuscaloosa. He's like, hey, can I go with you guys? And here's a future Cy Young Award winner. And, you know, just all these stories and all of the you know, all of the meals at the fast food places and coming up with all these favorite spots in these little towns and, and, and meeting people around the conference. You know, it's, it's funny, Kyle, because one of the people that I got to know best when I was first getting started and he was first getting started was Scott Strickland. Okay. Yeah. Scott Strickland was a student at, at Mississippi state and I was a student at Tennessee and we became friends and uh, he helped me, and I tried to help him. And uh, when the SEC basketball tournament was held in Knoxville in 1989, to thank him for all he'd done for me, I took him out to Calhoun's for, you know, some of their great barbecue. And um, and now he's the big deal athletic director at Florida. <laughs> and and uh, I saw him. At, he was at a conference in Indianapolis, and I saw him. We were there for the combine at the same time. And I'm like, you know, who would have ever thought? Um, you know, and, and guys like Andy Burcham, who does Auburn, um, a- Andy was was a guy that I got to know um, that, you know, Chuck was a- another guy that we got doing baseball because Tom Leach at Kentucky, I got to know through things like that because we were all the down the line guys. I've always said, you know, whatever Ward didn't want to do and Kessling didn't want to do, I got to do. So UT baseball was the first thing that was my thing. And I'll never forget calling John Wilkerson in 2001 when they made the College World Series and saying, hey, congratulations, because being the lead announcer, this is your moment. We had gone together in 95, but I was the lead announcer. Going in 2001 and 2005, I was so happy that he got to do that because that guy is a fabulous broadcaster. He should be calling big league baseball. I mean, he just should. I, oh, I mean, sure. he, he, he sounds that great. If I could sound like John Wilkerson for 30 minutes in my life, I'd make a million dollars. Cause I, I mean, I'll never sound like that. I mean, he's, but he's also, he's a phenomenal baseball announcer and we had so much fun together. Uh, great experiences. That's outstanding. And then uh, looking at your role now with the Titans, uh, calling the play-by-play, of course, is part of the job. But what can you tell us about the role you're in with the team and all the things outside of the broadcast that you do on a daily basis and can kind of be helpful for anybody, whether they're a college voice, professional voice. So take us through the big picture and what's important to you. Big picture, as John Ward told me, get into sales, know sales, understand sales, always be willing to work with sales. Greatest advice I ever got. It's the number one reason I got this job. And I was, before I came on with you guys today, I was working through some sales things to this, to this point, you know, uh, coming up with ideas, understanding that if you can't sell it, it's art. And that's great. Art's beautiful, but art don't pay the bills. Um, we, you know, you've you've got to understand that this is a part of what you do. And if you think the sales department is the enemy or what they do doesn't matter, I mean, it's an integral part of what you of what you do. And then how do you market it? How do you work with folks outside the building? And and it's you know, it's hand to hand combat going and speaking to civic clubs. It's different things that we do through our TV and radio product to get things out there. Social and digitals obviously change the world and all of this too. You've got to be able to do all of it. Um, If you think you're a great voice or you're a George Clooney lookalike and, you know, they're going to come find you standing in line at the Walgreens, they don't. You know, what happens is you put yourself in these places I told you guys, I got hired. They had never heard me call play by play. They had heard my voice, but they had people who have jobs in the business. They're looking for the right person. They're not looking necessarily for the right announcer. Sometimes it's the right announcer, but the majority of times they're looking for the right person. And so you have to take every part of the business as seriously as you can. And you have to love it. 
because it's going to be hard. Just no two ways about it. And final one for me, because I know we're up against it. You have to, again, you have other parts of the job. You have to get back to that job. But, uh, Mike, just for anybody who wants to do this, and you said it, um, the ability to be well-rounded, that goes a long way in this industry. Just w- what would be the final words for a college student or anybody who's been in it and hasn't gotten their break yet to, to keep pushing forward and uh, find their place in the industry? You can do this. It can happen for you. You can You can see what's out there and how it comes together and it can happen you have to keep plugging you know it's about commitment faith persistence humility respect responsibility you know keep those things in mind in what you do because here here's what i know kyle there's a guy who's going to call a high school football game in august in iowa who is a better announcer than i'll ever be If you turn on the radio and you listen to this person, you'll say, why is that guy doing high school sports in Iowa? Well, maybe it's because it's what he what he loves to do. Maybe it's because he just didn't get a call or he hasn't gotten a break. But you just never know where the break can come from, how the break can happen, what can lead to it. And so. If you're in the position that the break has happened for you, humility is important. Pulling people with you, uh, talking to young broadcasters, spending time with older broadcasters, continuing to try to learn. This process never ends. It's never over, and it's never over for the young guys or the old guys or the ones who are in between. It can it can happen. And that to me is the most important thing because so many people are negative about what your chances are or about what their chances are if you're positive and know that it can at that at some moment it can all fall your way you'll keep doing it the right way and if you keep doing it the right way at whatever level you achieve you'll be the very best you can be and people will have respect for you For me, I I would rather other broadcasters say, you know, that guy, he doesn't do it like I would do it. He doesn't sound like I would sound. Maybe he gets too excited or whatever, but he's a pro. And I, I think that's that's the thing you're striving for as a broadcaster is if you're a professional, good things can happen to you. Well, Mike, you are a professional, and I'm honored to be a part of the same broadcasting tree that you are. And I think at John Ward's a Remembrance Service, you said it best of all, Vol Network for life. And that's something I think about no matter who I'm calling games for is that same mentality. And you do that so well with the Titans, and we really appreciate all that you've shared with us today. Uh, Roger, th- Kyle, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, all Mike. right, that was Mike Keith, voice of the Tennessee Titans. We look forward to being with you next week for another edition of Broadcaster Hour. Thanks so much, everyone.